right. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, apologies, everyone, for the slight delay. But we will go ahead and get started without further ado. Um, so first and foremost, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Julian Hill. I use they, them, he, him pronouns. And I am a clinical teaching fellow, as well as a supervising attorney at Georgetown University Law Center with the Social Enterprise and Nonprofit Law Clinic. And I will be your moderator for, for today. And so just to set up the conversation, I wanted to give you all a little bit of context for the conversation that I will be having this evening with um, Dr. Jessica gordon Imhart. Um, this is the third of what will likely be a five-part uh, webinar series that we put together last year, really in contemplation of the ways in which there were opportunities to think about, talk about, and orient ourselves around the particular issues impacting uh, Black laborers and the ways in which um, the solidarity economy movement lawyering as a framework could support some of those types of initiatives. So we did a first session that focused on movement lawyering where we brought one of the students from Georgetown to sort of talk about their experience, learning about movement lawyering, learning about the solidarity economy. Second, we had a session with uh, Carmen Wethers Noble over at CUNY Law, who is a nationally recognized movement lawyer who focuses a lot of her work around supporting worker cooperatives and the larger solidarity economy um, movement in New York City. And now we're going to be talking uh, with Dr. Jessica gordon hart to really unpack for us some of the some of the misconceptions and some of the just unknown aspects of uh, the impacts of our economic system on, on labor generally and black labor specifically. And so that's where that's where we're at. We we hope to follow up this series, uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Where we focus in on what are some of those alternative um, institutions and practices that Black folks have been engaging in since their arrival here in the United States. So um, to preview the agenda for today, uh, after I uh, introduce uh, Dr. Gordon Imhart, um, she'll give us some remarks with respect to sort of economies, racial capitalism. And just other frameworks and information that will help orient ourselves in this discussion. And then we'll talk for probably a little less than half an hour where I'll ask some, some follow-up questions. And then we'll open up to the floor before we then have some of our community partners talk a little bit about their work. And then we'll close it out. And so we'll probably be done around 7.30. Couple logistics, just to make sure folks are aware. We are recording this session. We've recorded the sessions in part because we want to make sure that we are able to um, use this in the future for um, for the work that we hope to to continue to do uh, with uh, some of the community organizations that are that are engaged in here in DC. There's a Q and A function that folks should feel free to use as questions come up throughout. Um, to ask questions that we will uh, integrate throughout the conversation and ask sort of when we get to that part. And then there's also a chat function if you want to be in conversation with folks here and ask questions for everyone. So now I'll introduce my one of my one of my sheroes, friends, um, someone who has inspired me to get into this work. I'm um, Dr. Jessica Gordon Imhart author of Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice, which was published back in 2014, and again, really inspired me to get into this work. She's a 2016 inductee into the U.S. Cooperative Hall of Fame. And Dr. Gordon Imhart is a, community, is a professor of community justice and social economic development in the Department of Africana Studies, John Jay College, City University of New York, or CUNY. Um, Dr. Gordon Imhart is a political economist specializing in cooperative economics, community economic development, and community-based asset building, racial wealth inequality, solidarity economics, Black political economy, and community-based approaches to justice. 
I could list her affiliations for days, um, but I will note that probably among some of the most important ones for her is that she's a proud mother, um, Stephen and Susan, and the grandmother of Stephen, Hugo, Ismael, and he said Nimhart. So I will now pass it to, to Dr. Gordon Nimhart to give us some reflections. Thanks so much. Um, and I forgot to have you say that I'm a proud member of 1DC since 2002 and the member of the shared leadership team at 1DC. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, I have too many slides. Let's see, can I share my screen? Yes, I can. Um, so I apologize ahead of time. I'm gonna speed through some of the slides. Um, but I did wanna um, set the stage for right why I wanna talk about an economics of abundance and how that critique of economics of scarcity leads us toward a better notion of the sovereignty of black labor. So I also first would like to make sure I thank the organizers. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for thinking people are interested in this topic. Um, and I do, we didn't do a land acknowledgement, so let me do that. Um, acknowledge the original stewards of the land. It's the Lenape Nation, if we're here in DC or you're, we're here in DC. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm actually in the Bronx. So I'm in the Lenape Na Nation. You guys are in Piscataway Nation. <laughs> sorry about that. My brain gets scattered sometimes. I just was in DC this morning, so it's like, okay. Um, but I had Lenape there for New York, yeah. Anyway, sorry about that. Uh, so make sure, right, to understand, right, we're in settler colonialist system. Uh, in some ways we're on stolen land, but we also need to assert our rights um, to the land, right, and to uh, self-determination of the land. That brings us to acknowledging our ancestors as well, right? Those enslaved, those who continue to labor without just compensation, those who practice resistance, have practiced and continue to practice resistance, those who use solidarity and co economic cooperation for liberation. And I'd also just like to recognize the struggles of all those combating anti-blackness, patriarchy, environmental degradation. We just had Earth Day um, so you'll see I have a little bit about the environment in here, but I actually took out some of the environmental economic stuff. So you can ask me about that if you want later. And I'm not sure how many elders we have in uh, here with us, but I do want to make sure we acknowledge our elders as well. So um, I want to just talk about why I care about this, right? I'm a political economist. I see community as a community of workers, right? Of people who expend human energy and solidarity, right? So that we really can understand our relationships to us. And I'll, I'll get to this sort of at the end too, but as I said, I have too many slides. So I want to start with the punchline in some ways and then return to the punchline. So this notion that we're a community of workers, we expend human energy and solidarity because so often we think of work and labor as alien, right? As not part of who we are, as something we have to do to make money to survive, but really, right, as human beings, work and labor, it is, it's part of who we are. We do all kinds of different work and labor and we need to figure out better ways to recognize and value it. That's outside of this capitalist profit maximizing system, which is what makes us think that labor is bad and that we don't wanna be seen as workers. Um, if people wanna ask me about it, I'm in the tradition of a W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, political economist, Lloyd, black political economist, Lloyd Rogan, Lloyd Hogan, Black political economist Curtis Haynes, uh, Black feminist political economist Carolyn Hossein, and Black feminist political economist Nina Banks, right? And all of them in their different ways, all of us in our different ways, have talked about communities as groups of human activity um, and human work, not separate from the political economy, but actually the base of what we should be thinking of as our economics and the base of what solidarity economics is. Um, we don't have the luxury, especially as African-Americans, we never had the luxury to separate the two. And so I'm trying to help us think about the ways that we can elevate this notion of labor and take charge of it so that we can then use it to, to, um, to engage in and affect that social reproduction care and community that we all want and need 
um, and to elevate again the invisible as well as the visible work that we all do. So um, why is it a challenge to think of the economy and to think of ourselves that way? Well, it's a challenge because we live in a racial and gendered capitalism, which is all about maximizing profit at the expense of labor and people and mother earth, right? Um, and in a minute, I'll talk more about what this racial gendered capitalism looks like, but it's basically an economics of scarcity and exploitation. It disproportionately exploits people of color, women, LGBTQ people, et cetera, and workers, obviously. Um, and so that's why, right? That's what gets in the way. So the first thing we have to do to get above and to liberate ourselves from this is to understand this system. So um, I apologize ahead of time because I am going to sort of speed through explaining the system. But again, um, Julian's going to talk to me, so he'll slow me down or have me repeat things that he thinks need repeating. And you all, in your um, question and answers, can out, you know, can, can take me back to any of this stuff. And um, I think we can share the uh, the PowerPoint afterwards. But also, since it's taped, you'll be able to watch it over again. But so neoclassical economics is. Uh, the theory of capitalism. So capitalism is the practice, neoclassical economics is the theory. And maybe, can I, oh, I was trying to figure out how I can make more room because it looks like um, you might not be able to see the top. But anyway, I won't worry about that. Um, and neoclassical economics theory of economics is the, that economics is the management of scarcity that we don't have enough of anything. We're trying to manage the scarcity so that the people who have a little bit can make more of what they have. And that when people who have a little make more of what they have, that that's an engine of growth and, and everybody is supposed to benefit from that. So that's kind of a really um, basic understanding of capitalism and neoclassical economics, but the, the pieces are here on the slide, right? Um, the returns are to capital, not to labor. Uh, so we deny the majority uh, access to resources. So we privatize and demutualize and enclose, right? So that's the notion of enclosing the commons and private property, right? All that is to allow the people who have a little bit of something to maintain and to make more of that little bit of something they have so that they can maximize profits. Right, but they do that by by denying the rest of us, the majority, the access. Owners are stockholders. Their power derives from the amount of money they invest in and the number of stock they own. And then um, their wealth is about the returns that they get, how much they're able to um, to make that initial investment um, pay back for them. Um, it doesn't matter how they accumulate their capital, whether they exploit human beings, whether they exploit Mother Earth, that doesn't matter. What matters is that they keep augmenting what they have. And that's what capitalism is about. That's what counts when you look at all the ways that we measure capitalism. That's right. There's no measure about um, hurting people, hurting the planet, nothing like that. And then, as I said, there's this notion that individual greed and private property create their own growth and are justified because the assumption is that when the people who have a little something do something more with it, that helps everybody. Um, and then there's also this assumption about meritocracy, right? That because you have a little bit, that means you deserve to have more, you deserve access to capital. And even though resources are limited, you've proven that you're the one who should be in control, who should own the capital and therefore you own it. So what does it mean to be profit maximizing, right? It means that you create profits. So that means when you produce something, the inputs are usually land, labor, materials. The costs of inputs are right land, which earns rent or costs rent, right? So if you own the land, it earns you the rent money. If you don't own the land and you need to use it, it costs rent. Labor, the same thing. If you own your own labor, you earn money. If you have to buy labor, it costs wages, right? Materials are the cost of supplies. And then the profit is all the revenue that you get minus any of these costs. So what's the maximization of profit, right? That's where the domination is that you want more and more profit to that small minority of people who already have something. So it's an economic accounting model. It assumes that all the people who have a little bit of capital who are gonna augment it to make something more, make decisions in the same way, have the same information. Um, 
that there are no power inequities, there's nothing to get in the way of this rational decision making and symmetrical information. Um, and that the pursuit of profit is all that matters and right and gives you that return. And so that's, you know, uh, that's the justification. If you minimize all costs, you can increase revenues as much as possible. That gives you the profit maximization, right? It's not enough just to get a profit. You wanna get as much profit as possible, which again means you actually have to super exploit human beings and the environment. So that's what we mean by profit maximization. That's why we say it's a problem, right? For those of us who are worried about human beings, human survival and uh, the survival of the 99%. So the 1%, Profit maximization is a problem. It creates class inequality, right? And it depends on class, race, gender, and even ableism inequalities, right? Those who have some get more, they want to guarantee their stronghold and they assume they deserve it. So that whole, right, there's the ideology of it, the economics of it, the po politics of it, and even the social dimensions, right? So the 1%, the haves want to maintain their hold, the 99% of the have-nots, there's that myth that the haves deserve what they get and deserve to keep consolidating what they get. They have to have unemployment in order to exploit labor and to reduce costs because unemployment means that some people can't make a living, right? Can't, can't, if, if, you can't, if everybody can't get hired, then there's a crisis and a supply issue. And then the profit maximizers can benefit from that by, by undermining, right? Undercutting because people want, just want any kind of job. Of course, recently, a lot of people said they don't just want any kind of job. So we're, luckily we're moving into a different situation, but this is the general theoretical and practical understanding of racial capitalism and class inequality and profit maximization. So again, this notion that you have to have people who uh, can't get employment because then you get people fighting each other for employment and willing to take the lowest, right? The lowest wages, the, the least benefits. And that's again, how uh, the owners can profit maximize. And so uh, the constructs of inequality, these hierarchical polarizations create a paradigm where the economic and social constructs of patriarchy, gender inequality, racial inequality, justify and perpetuate class inequality keep the groups fighting among each other, reduce the possibility of alliances, and then these intersectional oppressions and impacts, right, have multiple um, uh, overflows, right, multiple spillover effects um, that always benefit the capitalists. It also engenders resistance, which is what we're going to get to at the end, but I wanted to also um, make sure we talked about what's employment and unemployment so we can understand labor, especially black labor, because black labor is, has the highest unemployment in, US, in the US consistently for what, I guess, ever since enslavement ended, right? We had forced employment and then we've always had the highest unemployment uh, ever since the end of uh, slavery. Um, and then the other thing to understand about racial capitalism and racial outcomes, right? Is that again, the mythology makes us think that we're at the bottom of the economics because of um, our constitutions and the fact that we're not smart enough, we're too lazy, we're this and that. So it's all about uh, assumptions of um, racial inferiority and behavioral issues, right? But, but really it's masking the structural issues, right? The fact that this system of um, planned scarcity and this notion of managing scarcity and profit maximization puts us all in struggles with each other, right? And creates all these structures that make sure that we continue to get exploited at the same time that it uses ideology that makes us think it's our fault that we're exploited. And the other issue is that there's all different kinds of overt and covert racism. And the best way, especially by the, you know, in the late 20th and the 21st century with structural racism, the best way to understand the impact and influence of racism is to look at the unequal outcomes because sometimes the inputs and the opportunities don't look unequal, they're masked, but you still get unequal outcomes and that's how we can still understand that racism still exists. 
So we have to look at those invisible structures to understand what's happening. Um, and so it's not profitable to address inequality, poverty, or sustainability, right? Markets don't operate where there is no profit. Capitalists can claim inequalities are not their responsibility or that addressing them will hinder their profit making, right? So they put this reducing costs ahead of creating benefits. So they, they create this false zero sum game, which is the assumption that some people have to lose so that other people can gain, but that other people's gaining again, the mythology that if you just let us 1% gain, it'll help everybody. Um, but this notion that there has to be a zero sum game, right? Is also about the same notion of scarcity. And as I said, those of us in the solidarity economy are now talking about, we need to talk about economies of abundance because if everybody is a worker for all in charge of production and self, uh, social, sorry, social reproduction and uh, sustainability of our economy, our planet and our human humanness, then there isn't a zero sum game. There's abundance, but we, but we have to structure it and organize it differently. But in capitalism, there's market failure because capitalism will only operate if they can make a profit. Even the so-called nonprofit sector um, still operates pretty much under this capitalism for-profit notion. Um, and that, again, that notion of market failure, the notion of um, scarcity, the notion of we have to maximize profits um, allows all these other exploitations and inequalities and demands um, unemployment. It also creates what we call these business cycles, highs and lows. Sometimes you get peaks and expansion, but often you get contraction and troughs. So a recession is a significant downturn for two consecutive quarters. A depression is a severe prolonged economic downturn. But again, right, the groups that are most exploited are almost always in a sort of recession, depression relationship um, because, right, we're always the least first fired, last hired, the least employed, that kind of thing. So, um, and again, neoclassical, neoliberal, which is neoliberal is sort of the more modern version of neoclassical reestablishing neoclassical capitalist responses and economic relationships, right? Always assume even when there's a downturn that there's some, that the problem is profits, right? That they're not making enough profits. And so in downturns, they keep reducing costs to try to increase business activity. The major cost is labor. And so government ends up subsidizing and supporting business as often subsidizing and supporting them to even reduce labor more or to pay labor less. And so again, the workers, we workers, the bulk of the, the community, the bulk of the population, right, get screwed, excuse my language. Um, and so there's joblessness. Right, so there's a common understanding, right, that we think of unemployment as people who don't work, who don't have employment options, who can't work, who haven't been working for a long time, as well as those who are just laid off, whether they're looking for work or not, right? But actually our government doesn't really measure joblessness. Our government measures what they call unemployment, which is uh, if you're looking for if you're still actively looking for work, but can't get work, then you're unemployed. But remember, I just gave you a list of a million different other ways you could be jobless, um, but those aren't counted in our unemployment. Um, you could also be looking for full-time work and have part-time work. That's not really counted in the unemployment either. So what is the unemployment rate according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, right? It's the federal, uh, calculation of the number of unemployed divided by the number in the civilian labor force. So um, employed people are people 18, sorry, 16 and over with a paid job. They're counted one time, no matter how many jobs they have. Unemployed are people who are jobless, looking for a job and available for work. So if you've given up, if you actually can't work, but you need a job, right, you're not counted. The civilian labor force that you're counted against or for is the total um, of the employed and the unemployed who are not in the military, right? So remember, there's very specific definitions of employed and unemployed. And then the labor force is those two categories of people who are not in the military but are employed according to this definition or unemployed. And then the unemployment rate is the unemployed 
uh, as a ratio of the civilian labor force. So it's not even about the number of people who are collecting unemployment insurance, and it's not about the jobless that I just listed what the jobless. Um, so I, I'm going to skip a little bit about this if you want to know more about these details, but these are a little bit more details on this slide about who is the employed, right? You officially have a job or you're officially self-employed, that kind of thing. Um, who's the unemployed? Again, we went through that. You have no paid employment and you're actively looking for a job and able and available to work in, in, the, right, in the next hour or whatever. Um, and then who are the people not counted? Again, all those other people I mentioned as jobless, right? People living in institutions, people who are not on active duty in the armed forces, those who are doing unpaid work, care work, volunteer work, unpaid housework, those who are attending job readiness or job training programs that are not attached to a job are also not counted. And then all those people who have given up, right? Who are not actively looking and who are not necessarily able to take a job in the next hour um, are not counted. So all the people that we think about when we think about our neighborhoods and we think about unemployment, right? Probably two thirds to three quarters of those people are not actually counted in those unemployment uh, rates that we get. What would be a better measure is this labor force participation rate, the employed to population. So the number of people in the labor force as a percentage of the civilian non-institutionalized population. Um, and sometimes we can get those data and that gives you a much better sense of who's employed and who's not and what kind of employment is happening in a, in a uh, state or in the nation. Um, and so I'm gonna run through this a little bit. We already talked about that, right? These assumptions behind the official unemployment rate, right? Um, we assume that we, we didn't realize, right? Most of us don't realize that we don't know what the unemployment rate is. Um, and also there's assumptions about, right? Unpaid care work is not a job. Volunteer work is not a job. Discouraged work, discouraged workers who haven't searched in the last 30 days are not considered unemployed, right? They're totally just out of the system. People who temporarily can't work aren't counted, right? And then there's also this notion that all jobs are equal. Remember, as long as you have some kind of paid employment, you're considered employed. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of job or anything like that. Um, and I think I sort of said most of this already. Uh, so, um, so, right, so then this notion that we don't look at the structural barriers, again, back to these issues about structure versus um, ideology and that kind of thing, right? We don't look at how many people gave up trying because of racial dis discrimination or colorism or gender discrimination or disabilities discrimination, right? Or who don't have transportation, right? We don't look at any, or childcare, I should have put on there because that's actually right now one of the biggest issues. We don't look at, any of those structural barriers, we just either you did, uh, you did work and are ready to work or you're not. Um, so we don't really learn that much from the unemployment rate. And yet, if you think about it, right, the media and all the economists, that's one of the major things they look at to see what's happening in the economy, how we're doing, how we're not doing. It's one of the major things to report. And yet it's such an inadequate notion. Um, and so it also masks the fact that our economy does not produce enough jobs, right? It doesn't un measure unemployment in ways that will address structural barriers and systemic problems. It does not produce enough decent jobs, nor does it value or pay living wages, and it doesn't compensate people for care work. So it also doesn't value care work. So that's the situation we're in. And what we're trying to think about or what, I'm, uh, what we're trying to bring to you in this series is to talk about a new way to think about all these things and a new way to think about structuring our economy so that we can move toward a new way that would really better serve human beings and better recognize and uh, help us to identify the places where we need to make change so that we can serve our, you know, have our economy really serve us all as human beings and serve our communities in ways that it needs to. So political economy, is one of those ways, right? Political economy is actually one of the first um, notions of an, of an economy, right? That you can't study economics without the politics and power relationships and without studying them and understanding them. 
political economic analysis allows us and me to give you that whole um, analysis I just gave you about economics of scarcity and neoclassical capitalism, right? It's uh, because of political economy that I can break it down in the ways that I did, because as I said uh, early on, right, capitalism doesn't doesn't look at structural barriers. It doesn't look at inequalities. It, right? it makes assumptions that there are no structural barriers, there are no inequalities, et cetera. So you need another theory, another structure, another paradigm in order to understand this. And that's political economy. There's a variety of different kinds of political economy. And um, solidarity economics is actually a type of political economy. So political economy recognizes and studies the interactions between and among economic structures, institutions, and the socio-political relationships that surround it, right? It's a study about power and control in economics, how decisions are made, what the power relationships are, how unequal power and control influence economic interactions. It investigates who controls the tool, who controls the economy, the, the uh, exchange production and exchange that we engage in. And it understands and recognizes that economics is not neutral. It's not like just a neutral science of supply and demand um, it's really more about right the ideologies and the and the power relationships, um, and so an economy is a tool that can affect a certain way of life. Right in terms of capitalism, it affects a life that allows the one percent to own and control everything and to decide what to do. Right, and the rest of us are at its bequest. Um, and it allow right, and once you, uh, once the people in power choose the capitalist tool, then they're in charge. They can perpetuate their own advantage um, and their prior endowments, which are usually stolen and unearned, but they pretend were earned and deserved. But what if we pulled back? What if we looked at what economics really is, right? So that we could build a new society based on what economics really is. So instead of looking at neoclassical economics and economics of scarcity. Let's look at the elements of how people self, uh, sorry, socially reproduce, how we make and do the things we need to do to, to survive as human beings, right? Well, we need product production, right? That's how we, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> what we do about how we make, right? How we create the things that we need to survive and what, what we do to make them, right? That's the production part of economics, what we do, right? That's the sort of labor, the work, right? We need to nurture, preserve and reproduce ourselves. Um, so that's part of what we do and what we do in terms of the protection, how we do, how we make the things we need to make, right? There's also part of economics is how we value the work and the other activity that we do. There's exchange and, um, and trade and things like that. So how do we value all those things? That's part of economics. The exchanges of goods and services, trade, the use of money, that's part of economics. How we regulate those activities, right? If we do them through markets and private ownership and uh, profit maximization, that's capitalism. If we do it through solidarity and human connections with each other, that's solidarity economics. If we do it by consensus, working together, that's democratic economics. Right, so that's what I mean by let's step back and think about what do what do economies do, and so then what is economics aside from all the subheadings and the ideologies, and then the other final part about economics is that's about also how we measure these activities. Right, how do we know that we're doing these things? How do we measure whether we're doing them effectively? Right, again, the measurements that we know unemployment, GDP things like that are all from a capitalist perspective, but there's ways to measure and look at and understand our economics from any of our other, right? From solidarity economics, uh, democratic economics, any of those things also have ways to measure activities, right? What do we decide is invisible or visible? What do we decide we value and don't value? That's all about how we measure it and how we talk about it. So that's sort of what economics is in general, and now I'll quickly talk about, you know, uh, the different kinds of political economy that help us to understand ourselves as human beings and help us to create a human, humanist economics, if you, if you will, and an economics of abundance. So feminist economics is one of the things, and actually I forgot to mention, I should have first mentioned black political economy, which is 
political economy, but with a focus on uh, people of color, especially people of African descent and their relationship to capitalism, as well as their relationship to the economy and trying to understand black relationship, uh, the relationship of black people and the impact of anti-blackness on our economics, right? So that's black local economy. Sorry, I forgot to put a slide for that. Feminist economics, right, is against the devaluing of women's work and the devaluing of feminine traits in economics, right? So feminist economics also, just like black political economy and solidarity economics, which we'll talk about in a minute, all focused on the values of social reproduction, caring and invisible labor. In fact, feminist economics is the thing that gave us that notion of invisible labor and caring economies, because again, they were invisible and devalued under uh, capitalism. Right, how to integrate work and family is also part of what feminist economics has tried to help us understand. Um, and then more specifically, feminist economics looks at gender, wage, and occupation equality or inequality, right? Recognizing intersectionalities between race, gender, and class, especially black feminist economics has been more, much more concerned with those intersectionalities between gender, race, and class, and how when race and gender are combined, what does that look like? And why sometimes feminist economics doesn't always connect with racial, but more and more it has, right? And then the connections with social movements, right? Feminist economics, just like black political economy, solidarity economics are also all about um, paradigm changes, right? Applying economic analysis to make change, to make a difference, to use knowledge, to use um, these theories to help us understand how to transform things, how to make change. So that's the other thing that's so um, different about political economy from neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economics isn't trying to understand and change anything. It's trying to um, perpetuate, right, that profit maximization. And then, so solidarity economics, I think if you were at the other two uh, sessions, you probably already learned a little bit, but I'll just quickly again go over another form of political economy that focuses much more on the ways that people uh, join together to create all the different kinds of, to, to make sure all the different aspects of an economy are for people and based on solidarity, right? So it's an alternative framework, especially to neoliberal uh, capitalist globalization. It's grounded in these notions of solidarity and cooperation, anti-oppression, non-hierarchy, promote social and economic democracy, equity in all dimensions, sustainability, so there's the environment part, the race, gender, class issues, right? It provides a new notion of labor and work. Again, labor and work are all about how do we do this together to make the world, society, the communities better, not how are we augmenting and providing, maximizing uh, profit for any one group of people, right? It's, it's about uh, pluralist and organic in its approach, meaning the, it recognizes there's lots of different kinds of structures and strategies that can achieve these uh, equitable solidarity cooperative activities. So there's not, they're not pushing one specific strategy or structure and it's organic and meaning it builds up from the bottom up, right? It, it, it bubbles up from what people start to do as human beings, and then it bubbles up to more formal from the informal to the more formal. Um, and it allows different forms and strategies in different contexts, visible, recognizes visible and invisible structures, values, caring and support, human development. Um, and it's seen by many of us as a strategy to decolonize the economy, right? To get rid of all the racial, gendered inequality, right, in the economy. So that's sort of the broad strokes of what a solidarity economy is. Cooperative economics, which I'm going to talk about in the next, I think in May, right, um, comes out of solid, is another kind of solidarity economics, and we'll talk about that more next time. So I'm just going to end with back to the economics of um, abundance. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, right, so the means, how do we get to abundance? How do we get to solidarity economics and, a solid, and an economics of abundance? We've got, we have to have economic democracy. We have to practice economic democracy in order to get there. So what is economic democracy? Economic decisions, right, 
are democratically made, people-centered, not centered on profit. So you're not making economic decisions based on profit maximization. You're making them based on human need and, and um, human activity, right? Again, it's gonna be grassroots economic based on solidarity and cooperation. It reduces hierarchy and dominance. So instead of economics being about scarcity and certain people deserving, right? The, to take everything and other people not deserving to have anything right. This time it's a, a horizontal structure where everybody equally deserves rights. So there's a notion of equity, not just equality. And we can talk about those differences if you need to. Um, so lack of hierarchy or at least reducing hierarchy, reducing dominance, multiple voices being heard, multiple recognizing there's multiple stakeholders as we participate together, right? Sometimes the workers and the consumers are different, but often we're the same people, but it recognizes that we can have different, um, uh, what's it called, uh, different uh, kinds of roles in the economy. And, and we can each in ourselves have multiple roles, but also have the voices of multiple stakeholders in the democracy. Um, workers and invisible laborers in economic democracy have the most voice, right? Have the largest voice in what they make, what it costs, how they work together, what they get paid, what happens, right? That's again, workplace democracy and this notion of economic democracy. Um, here's one of my favorite uh, graphics about what a solidarity economy looks like from creation, right? Land, collective land ownership, land trust, the commons to, um, production, right, through worker co-ops, not-for-profit collective, self-employment, family, plan-based production, to exchange and transfer, gifting, solidarity markets, free trade, sol sliding scale pricing, community currencies, bartering, right, all the different, those are all the different solidarity ways to exchange, consumption and use, right, housing co-ops, consumer co-ops, ethical purchasing, collective houses, self-provisioning, so where we live, and how we get the things we need um, back to the sort of surplus allocation. What do we do with finance savings, right? So uh, rotating savings and loan, ISUSUs, cooperative loan funds, credit unions, uh, community development bank, self-financing, et cetera, um, to bring you then back to creation. So um, hopefully that gives you a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about the solidarity economy. And then the final goal of course is economic justice and economics of abundance. So we want equitable exchanges, right? The most number of people can benefit. We distribute abundance fairly. There's not a zero sum game, right? The notion is that as human beings operating with a values-based system, right? That we can create as much abundance as we need because right, we have abundance right? We have unlimited energy or almost unlimited energy if it's not spent, right? Working for other people and being exploited, right? We have unlimited sense of energy. If we have the right balance and relationship to land and mother earth, right? We can make that work and sustainable. Um, we can distribute the abundance fairly because we're going to practice real economic democracy, right? We're going to eliminate exploitation and inequality, eliminate poverty, eliminate private monopoly, dominance by businesses. There's lots of structures um, in solidarity economics that we can still own and have businesses, but we own them together. We do social entrepreneurship, cooperative ownership. So we're not saying we're not gonna have economic activity, right? But we're saying we can create a system where we're self, uh, sorry, where we're self-sustaining where we're uh, socially reproducing ourselves as human beings, but we're not having to lose our humanity. We're not having to be exploited or exploit other people in order to do that. So we're, um, we're not seeking profit at the expense of human need and human dignity. We're building economies based on human values and the needs of society to eliminate need and to enable prosperity for everybody. That will lead us to human perfectibility and community well-being. Right, because right now we're being strangleholded, right, and and exploited, so that we're not really able to perfect ourselves as human beings, because the economy that we're in is so repressive and oppressive. In addition to how it's you know degrading uh, the earth and limiting our possibilities of even living on the planet, right. So we need right this change in paradigm, this change in notion about what it even means to be in an in an economy and to create economic activity 
and to do it in a way that creates this kind of abundance. So if we changed our notions, right, our goals from maximizing uh, profit to maximizing human potential, right? That's what my friend uh, Curtis Haynes, he gave me that language about maximizing human potential. And he says he got it from Lloyd Hogan. But instead of maximizing profit, what if we focused on maximizing human energy, right? The energy that we expend to reproduce and sustain ourselves and to produce innovations to keep perfecting social reproduction, right? So, you know, what production is, even manufacturing, is really creating innovations so that we can keep reproducing ourselves as human beings better and better ways, right? So we're creating things, all the things we do are creating ways, right, that we can do better, we can sustain ourselves better um, so that we can have prosperity and leisure. That, those should be our goals, right? Right now, so many of us, we just want a job so we can feed our children and have a roof over our head. That's not liberating, right? We also need these kinds of uh, an economics of labor and abundance so that we can address racial and gender exploitation and get rid of it, right? We need to put energy into education, right? And practice of these human liberating practices, right? The more we practice them, the more we learn about them and then practice them, right? The stronger we get, the more we can uh, create, the more, the more alternatives we can create and the stronger our solidarity economics can be. And so instead of waiting, right, for a whole system change, we can be in our own little spaces. We can be making change, learning about it, and then making the change. Hogan talks about two spheres, and I'll just do this quickly because I want to get us to the conversation, right? The internal and the external labor markets. The internal labor markets are all the things we do sort of privately, the home homemaking, the social reproduction, et cetera. And the external labor markets are where we make the money to support the internal labor market, right? But he still kind of talks about it as, a, as market systems. I'm trying to get us away from market systems, right? I want us to focus more on being workers and laborers, but how we do that under our own control, how we connect that, right? Balance the internal and the external, control it and make, again, make it so that it's, it's, it's about abundance. Nina Banks also talks about women's labor in communities needs to be elevated and highlighted, right? Given the respect we need. So that's, um, you know, I'm using those kinds of, from both those economists, those kinds of notions about um, valuing and respecting all different kinds of labor, whether it's internal or external, and making sure there's that balance so that we can control it in ways that are helpful to creating whole human beings, you know, prosperous communities, um, and economics that reflects, right, all those values and all those needs as opposed to um, dampen. And so again, uh, where I started out, so what if we see ourselves as a community of laborers, right? And not see labor and work as the things we do that we're paid for, that are onerous, that are horrible, that take us away from our family and that depress us and exploit us, right? Um, that's capitalist labor, but what about this notion of humanist labor, right? Working is part of what makes us human. It's how we sustain our lives. So we need a new vision, a renewed vision of work as a positive, productive, joy-producing collective activity, right, that will create human prosperity, help us to develop to our fullest as human beings um, in a world that we're not exploiting either the humans of it or the land and the mother nature, the nature of it. And so that's what we mean by an economics of abundance work is good and fun, we collectively control it, we do it with others, there's no scarcity, no zero-sum game. What we can create and produce then is endless. We aren't fighting over crumbs because some people are hoarding and stealing our energy and our products. We're creating a culture of agency, education, and practice for the common good. And together we're designing equity and abundance. And once we do that, we can free ourselves and that, and we can be liberated. So together we can transform our system. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I was clapping on behalf of myself, but also other folks who have um, been, been here and, and listening, and hopefully learning. Um, so thank you, uh, Professor, per usual, for just unpacking so many important 
terms, um, important systems, right? And, and some of the interlocking sort of elements that we need to to understand and be able to then, as we talk a little bit more, you, you did that today, but as we talk about a little bit more in the next session to figure out how, you know, where do we go from, from here? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start um, just, you know, asking some questions um, and most of it will focus on some of the discussion sort of in, in the first kind of chunk of the presentation and as questions come up in the Q&A box, then I'll start to integrate those as well. So that way we have, um, so it can be a bit, a bit more fluid and, and folks who are here can get their questions answered as well. So um, just starting off, I wanted to know, could you talk a little bit about like the notion of meritocracy and, and what sort of impact that has on black labor, um, particularly as it relates to unemployment? So yeah, the notion of meritocracy, it sounds so innocuous, right? I mean, in some ways, you know, we grew up with it, you know, if you're good Calvinist or Lutherans, right? It's, it's knocked into you from your religious perspective, right? It's knocked into us from sort of our work ethic, right? The, the assumption is that if you work hard enough and if you follow the rules, right? And if you're smart enough that you, you deserve the spoils. Um, and, you know, it's hard to like be against a meritocracy. <laughs> so I'm not trying to say that, that that's not something we should aspire to, but the problem is it's a, it's a mythology and it's not actually the way that our capitalist system works. It's a part of the mythology and the uh, miseducation, you know, the, the misuse of language to, to make, to placate us and to make us again, to justify the fact that the 1% run off with all the spoils and leave us with nothing, right? So you can, you know, you can justify yourself as a capitalist. You can say you merit getting all the wealth that you've, uh, you've stolen and amassed because you did certain, certain things, right? You can say you went to school, you, or some, actually some capitalists haven't gone to school, but anyway, you can list sort of all the things that give you merit. And one of the things, uh, one of the mythologies in uh, entrepreneurship is the entrepreneur, the one who runs off with all the money is supposed to have um, exhibited, uh, what do you call it? Deferred gratification. Right, that's also part, part of the meritocracy, right? You're, you've deferred your gratification by saving and investing. And so then you deserve the, that interest, the returns, the profits, right? Because you were so, right, you were so, uh, whatever that word is, so well regulated, so well controlled, right? And that all the rest of the people, right? All the rest of us poor people or working people, right? don't have that, right? We can't delay gratification enough. We always have to just buy this, buy that. We have to do this, do that. And so we obviously are the undeserving, right? So that's part of the meritocracy. Then there's this meritocracy of that we, you know, that we had all the, that the, again, the entrepreneur or the capitalist had all the ideas. So it was the only one who risked anything, right? They put all their risk into this and they had the big ideas as if nobody else has ideas. But again, that's back to the what's being valued, right? Mm -hmm. If you're just being valued that, that you or your family were able to plunder, right? And hoard money and take it away from other people. And then, you know, have an opportunity to invest it somewhere in a place that keeps making more money. That's supposed to be, you're supposed to again, have merited from that, but really you didn't. You're a, you're a pirate, you're a plunderer, right? <laughs> you're an exploiter. That's really how you did it. But again, we're using language to mask. Um, so that's why I'm such so anti the notion of, um, of merit and meritocracy, because merit, again, is all tied up in capitalist uh, mm. language, and it masks all the exploitation and plunder and inequality mm. um, that's really happening. And then it makes us feel like we deserve it, right? Mm -hmm. We feel like, okay, yeah, I was too lazy. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I didn't have a good idea. I didn't save the money. And then we blame ourselves and think it's okay um, for them to go off and take all the money and leave us. When we actually are the ones who get, who created the money for them, right? We're the ones who did all the work. We're the ones probably who had most of the ideas too. And if it wasn't us, they got government subsidies, which is also us, it's our tax money, right? So it masks all that stuff 
and makes them look like they deserve it and they should have it and that we deserve what we get, which is nothing. But Jessica, <laughs> right? You know, our, our good friend Nixon back in the day told us, you know, black people, we can, we can win at capitalism. P Diddy just said the other day, he's hungry, I need to be more hungry. And if I'm hungrier, I too, can master this game. I just got to stop being this laborer and become a capitalist myself. So, so how do you, how do you think about sort of that, which is very popular, you know, you, you know, in, in a lot of different spaces and places. What, what's, what are your thoughts with respect well, to that? Well, you know, the other problem is that capitalism is exploitation. So, is it okay even if it's one of us? Is exploitation okay? Is it okay? if one of us is exploiting the rest of us. I mean, some of us might say, well, at least it's better than the white guy or whatever, but that's right, but we're not, we haven't addressed the exploitation yet. We haven't addressed the fact that capitalism is ruining the earth, right? It's making the earth, mother earth, inhabitable, inhabitable for human beings, right? Um, that's a very serious thing, right? We talk about climate change and there's all this argument about it, but meanwhile, the earth is make is becoming inhabitable. Soon human beings won't be able to live on it. Um, I once heard, you know, just to try to give us a laugh, so this is such heavy stuff, right? Um, George Carlin, the comedian, who I'm not really a big fan of, but he had a great joke about this. He said, you know, I don't know what all this issue about environmentalism and whatever is, he said, it's not the earth that's going to die. The earth is going to transform into something else, but it's going to be something else that human beings can't live on, he said. So, we, you know, I mean, he was wrong to say we shouldn't be environmentalists because we should, but his point was right. It's not that the earth is going to be gone. It's just not going to be where people, human beings aren't going to be able to live on it. And so that's what mm -hmm. we have to focus on, right? So we need to focus on the fact that we have an economic system, what, 500 years old now? that is destroying the earth and it's also destroying human beings. It's been destroying human beings, right? The whole 400 years of enslavement destroyed Africa. Africa had been a thriving continent with this large population uh, of human beings on it. In fact, it's the first continent that human beings, our current, our current uh, biology of human beings started there, right? But capitalism almost destroyed it. Um, capitalism destroys women, destroys, right? And so why would we want, I, I'm not gonna put all my efforts into fighting for some, a couple of, you know, the 1% of black folks to exploit all the rest of us. That's not the world I wanna live in. That's not what makes sense to me. And it's also, again, very disingenuous of the capitalists, because even if 1% of black folks get to be capitalists, um, that's still like, a point oh one percent of all the capitalists, right? They're not even really, they're not giving up anything to let a couple of black folks own something. Mm -hmm. And even the mm -hmm. black capitalists and the black wealthy don't own as much as the white wealthy own. In fact, most black wealthy don't know, even own as much wealth as the poorest whites own. So, you know, again, it's throwing crumbs, it's having us fight over crumbs, it's having us feel like as long as one or two of us can get out, that it's, again, that there's a meritocracy to it, right? That it's not a racial system, it's not an exploitative system because a couple of us can climb out, so then it's, it's okay. And so again, it's placating us, but we're still accepting this economics of scarcity as zero sum game and this whole exploitation that is really just not sustainable. So yeah, so I can't, I'm, mm. I, I don't actually believe in black capitalism. I, it's another mythology and it's, it makes no sense to me. And it's not a system I'm interested in. Yeah, no, um, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know, I know we don't have a lot of a time, but my, my, my students actually like, I also have a, a rant about, what was that movie, The Pursuit of Happiness mm -hmm. with Will Smith, Will remember Smith, yeah. how he became a millionaire or whatever. And, um, you know, if you actually, you know, it's a feel good movie, right? But if you actually, pull it apart the way I'm doing and pulling apart capitalism, right? There's so much wrong with that movie, right? Mm. First of all, right? He's one of 12 people that get into this program that get a chance to buy to be, I don't know what, to be an intern or something in some whatever. But so what happened to the other 500 people that applied, right? So that's the first thing. 
right? Only 15 of them even get to try, right? The second problem with it is the minute he gets ambitious, right? He's got to get rid of the wife. I don't mm -hmm. know if any of you remember this movie or not, but oh, right, he gets rid of the wife. Uh, I forget exactly why, but she's not, you know, she's not supporting him enough for what he has to do to get competitive to do the thing. And so he, you know, he leaves her, um, you know, then we have to feel sorry for him because he takes the kid. So that's supposed to mean, you know, he's a decent guy, mm -hmm. but then they have to sleep in the bathroom or something. But then you can, realize- can, can, we, can, can, we touch, can we touch on that piece? Just a minute. <laughs> what you, yeah, and then I, he's I, also I, exploiting the childcare person. I just wanted to put that part in. Yeah, and you talked about it a little bit earlier too, just in terms of certain invisibilized labor. Oftentimes there's a gender dynamic when we talk about that. And so, so I have two different questions. I'll ask them one at a time. Um, the first one is, if you could, and you talked about this a little bit, can you further unpack just like how gender, race, and class sort of interlock within this sort of racial capitalist system that we're in? Yeah, well, you know, the, the uh, intersectionality of race and gender exploitation, race and gender exploitation is so intersectional. There's a bunch of things that happen, right? First of all, you get these segmented occupations, right? For a long time, right? Domestic service was only black women, right? Teaching was only white women. Um, what do you call it? Hauling and, uh, and loading was only black men, you know? So the first problem is all these uh, segregated and um, separations of what kind of uh, occupations. And then those occupations get paid according to the racial and gender segregation, right? In fact, I just heard a great um, podcast about this. They were talking about the whole problem with, the, with the healthcare services, right? And pretty much healthcare is so devalued, partly because originally it was Black women who were doing, you know, healthcare, home care, and with it, taking care of the sick, right? And mm -hmm. so from the beginning in our capitalist society, healthcare was always uh, degraded and whatever. So now, except, you know, the doctors, right? And the, I guess the pharmaceuticals who run off with all the money in the healthcare system, still all the nursing jobs and the other healthcare jobs, right, are all, right, horribly paid, right? And this is all coming out now, especially with COVID and stuff, right? Who were the essential workers, right? Mm -hmm. All the people who were exploited, who we never cared anything about and never paid enough about. And yet suddenly they're the ones that we have to have, but we're still not paying them, right? We're not protecting them. We're not paying them, et cetera. So that's all connected to this, right? It's all about racial and gendered capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're allowed again to say this work is only for these kind of people and they don't need, right? If they're women, they don't need much because their husbands are the real breadwinners. If they're black women, they need almost nothing because they used to be enslaved and we never cared about it then when they were enslaved. And if they're black men, they're only brutes and they're only good for their muscles. And so we don't have to pay them too much because we know black people don't need much anyway because they don't, right? So all these stereotypes and mythologies are built into even what jobs we have and what we value in the jobs we have now, right? And then you get people you know, clawing each other, climbing, trying to climb over each other just in order so they could have a roof over their head and feed their children. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if I, that exactly answered your question, but um, that notion, yeah. and then the under the undervaluing of the care, right? So teaching, childcare, right? All those things that we are totally essential, especially essential to social mm -hmm. reproduction. We pay the, we are paid the worst and are usually relegated to women, right? Um, and again, that's sort of back to the zero sum game, right? And the zero sum game is based on these intersecting exploitations. Yeah, no, I mean, you definitely answered my question. And I like how you put it within the context of, you know, COVID and what's been going on uh, to kind of really give a hyper visible uh, example of how, how that shows up and how people have seen it show up. So we have a question from the audience, from Leona. Um, do you think it's possible to develop an economy where the primary goal is to maximize the production of justice? And in thinking about justice, they highlighted two things. One is guarantee that no person is mistreated. 
and two, guaranteeing that the person needing help the most gets the most constructive help, and that's per Neely um, Fuller. So what are your thoughts on that as the, the primary goal, Justice? Absolutely. Um, if I didn't put that in my definition of what economic justice is, I, that, that's partly what I meant. So I think, I think it's definitely should be our goal and I think it's definitely an achievable goal. Why is it achievable? Because I believe I'm a humanist economist at root. And that means that I believe that as human beings, that's our natural inclination right, is to create systems that maximize um, serving human need and perfecting ourselves to our highest level. And so I do think it's achievable. Um, I'm also optimistic about it being achievable because of the research I've done, which we're going to talk about more next week, but or not whenever in May. Um, but the re I guess that is next week. But anyway, <laughs> Because the research I've done on solidarity economics in African American communities has shown me that even under the worst conditions, even under enslavement and then under Jim Crow and um, white supremacist terrorism, we practiced solidarity economics and cooperative economics. We did things together. We pooled our resources in order to make sure we all had what we needed. Um, and so I've seen, you know, I've seen examples of it through history. Yes, unfortunately, often the white terrorism tried to tear it down or ruined it. Often we didn't have enough resources or we didn't have people trained enough in how to do something alternative. So yes, there's always been challenges, but I still have keep, I keep seeing examples, right? There's not a decade in US history where there weren't African-Americans and other people too, but I've, you know, my research is on African-Americans. There has not been a decade in US history, actually, I don't think there's a decade of human history where we can't find examples of human beings helping each other, working with each other, especially when they can get under the radar of capitalism or that part. Be, or, or, be, or be secluded from capitalism, right? So sometimes these uh, maroon communities and stuff, but whenever we've been able to either be under the radar or away from capitalism, and sometimes even under capitalism, there's examples everywhere of how we help each other, how we work together. Um, and the problem is that these last 500 years of capitalism have alienated us from that sense of solidarity and support. It makes us feel like either it, it's stupid or we can't do it, or it makes us forget mm. that that's how we do it, right? But even if we look at our own lives, any one of you who are here today, could look at your own lives. And I know you practice solidarity economics in some form, even if you never label it that or whatever, but you barter with other people sometimes. You know, you have apples and they have uh, an orange and you switch with that, or I babysit for you and you drive my kids to school, or I make you dinner and you fix my plum. I mean, we do it all the time. We don't label it, we don't think about it, but we're always helping each other, sharing with each other, right? But because the dominant ideology of our society and the dominant economics and the way that we can make money doesn't mm -hmm. recognize that, we either forget it or minimize it, right? But we really already, it's in our DNA to share. In fact, there was a study that found that when people cooperate, they get endorphins. It actually makes us feel better and happier to cooperate mm -hmm. with each other. But again, we, for, we, we forget it or we can't explore it as much because we're so oppressed by this capitalist system that we're in. So that's what we have to remember, that our real essence is not this system. Mm. So we've got to, you know, continue to keep hammering away to make sure we can practice what's really what we are as human beings and what economics really should be for us as human beings. We just need to keep keep working at it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the system is literally making us sick and it's making us less human, right? It's making us less inclined to to build the type of relationships that we, we've been put here to build. So I, so I appreciate you lifting that up. So we're going to take one more question from the audience before we then turn it over to our community partners who co-sponsor this event. So this question is from Dante. What is the role of political struggle in struggling for the solidarity economy or an economy dominated by cooperatives? So um... 
for me, the political struggle is in parts. The very first part is really the education part, right? We really need to make sure we're educated so that we understand, right? So we can take tear apart and critique and understand both what's wrong with the capital system we're in and what's right about the system we want to build. Because we need to be able, we need to understand that what we're trying to build is viable, right? Achievable and viable. And we need to understand why, right? Why we want, why we want to create this system. So that's the education part. And I really honestly believe we need to start with our kids, not just with ourselves. The more we can help to train and teach our children about how to think in a, an economy of abundance and in solidarity, the, the more, you know, because they're the future, right? And they're the ones who are, are going to take over the stuff that we're going to try to build, right? In fact, in some ways, they're already building or could be already building some of the stuff we want to start to build, right? So we need to include our children in that. We need to include ourselves. We need to commit ourselves to that kind of collective learning. And I don't mean formal education necessarily. Um, though the more we can include it in our formal education, the better, but I'm also talking about informal education, cooperative, collective education among ourselves. We need, we need to do that. So that's the first step. Then the second step is we need um, praxis, you know, thinking and acting, right? So we need to start doing the things that we're learning about. We need to start practicing it, even if it's small and in significant kinds of things just so we can get used to it because that's the other problem I don't believe that we can just one day wake up and say we're going to operate without capitalism and in this solidarity economy because most of us don't even know we don't know how to make collective decisions we don't know about how to how to get through conflict to come to a joint real consensus building we don't right we don't know how to do most of that stuff because that's not what our the current system that's not the system we've been educated under it's not the system we've had experience working in so we've got to start doing it, even no matter how small, if it's just a side um, uh, buying club or something. We need to just start practicing the stuff that we're learning about solidarity and cooperative economics. We need to do it slowly, quietly, build up, get the experience. While we're getting the experience, we're also learning what kinds of policies and structures that we need, right? So that we're building mm -hmm. our knowledge about what kinds of um, political power we need, what kinds of political changes we need, what kind of laws and policies we want to put in place. Then the third or fourth step of policies and laws were the third step. The fourth step then is to start, start to take over politics, right? Try to figure out, is it a political party we want to create? Or do we just want to infuse one of the parties with people who believe and think this way, start getting them elected so that they can slowly start to enact those policies and laws that we're saying we want. Um, but we're also going to use collective action to start to demand even the people who are already in power to change those laws and policies so we can do more of what we want to do. Because the more we do it, the more we have to build on and the more interlocking systems we can create that then will be more impenetrable, even if we haven't totally uh, destroyed the other system. Um, but I do think there is a political strategy in terms of we can start to try to get people in power who also believe what we believe or are willing to try to start doing. But getting them in power before we know what we're doing and know what we need, I don't think makes a whole lot of sense. So that's why mm -hmm. I feel like we have to build it up again. That's the organic part, right? From the bottom up, learning together, trying these things out, practicing it, figuring out what works and what doesn't, what more we need. And then from that kind of self-knowledge and community knowledge, then start putting, you know, demanding things and then putting people in place who can make the real changes. Cool. Cool. No, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Jessica. So we're gonna we're gonna shift now to a few of our community partners. But before that, I want to thank um, my colleagues uh, here at Georgetown at the Workers' Rights Institute, um, as well as the George uh, Georgetown Law um, Socialist Student Union. Um, as well as, of course, uh, folks with 1DC, including you, Jessica. I see some folks in the in the audience as well from 1DC, so good, good to see those folks. And just a quick reminder is that we'll be talking about what some of those strategies have been that Black folks have been employing in a little bit more depth when we go to our second session, which is probably going to be in June. Um, June 20th, I believe, is the date that we have tentatively. So I'm going to pass it first over to, um, to Dante from the Claudia Jones School for Political Education.
Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Professor uh, Gordon Empire, for the answer to my question. <laughs> and I also want to appreciate you for uh, joining us uh, about, I think, about two years ago now uh, on a program we had uh, with you and Dr. Wolf and uh, Camilla uh, Pinheiro Harnaker. Uh, okay, two minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for that talk. And thank you, Julian, for uh, inviting us and uh, allowing us to be uh, co sponsors for this great series. Um, unfortunately, I didn't catch the earlier classes, but you know, I have studied some of this work. So, um, and I appreciate all the work that uh, 1DC and uh, Dr. Gordon Empire is doing um, with her work and the uh, work around Black cooperatives and uh, that as well. You know, myself, um, I live in a housing co op here in DC, in Columbia Heights. Um, you know, I organize with some folks that have been in this sort of scene for many, many years. Um, uh, and we have a limited equity co-op that I live in. So it's actually very nice to live in a place that's trying to keep black people in DC through this sort of model. Um, but anyway, so I'm also with the, the Claudia Jones School. My name is Dante. Um, I'm originally from California. I just want to say that. Um, but yeah, so Claudia Jones for folks who don't know, uh, she was an immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago, uh, you know, immigrated here when she was young, mother died very young. And, uh, you know, she developed um, a heart condition from housing, poor housing in Harlem, uh, but she became a major uh, theoretician and uh, organizer with the Communist Party. Uh, but we know, you know, she was eventually deported because of her views in the 1950s under McCarthyism. Um, but I wanted to plug, you know, given this question around race, gender, and class, and intersectionality, and Black feminism, and, uh, you know, struggling for a new economy, new political, social makeup uh, of this country and the entire world, um, you know, Claudia was at the center of that movement um, in the 1930s and 40s, and even uh, early 50s, um, uh, before she was deported, and also st struggled in, uh, uh, in London, uh, where she was deported, organizing the West Indian community uh, there, so, um, but, her most known work is The Ends and the Neglect of the Problems of the Negro Woman, uh, where she, you know, basically synthesized this uh, triple oppression, which she called it, which, you know, some might call Black radical feminism today or uh, intersectionality. Uh, but, you know, understanding that Black women are like the most oppressed um, in society uh, because they're a working person, uh, at that time a Negro and, and a woman, right? So, um, you know, we're trying to like basically continue her legacy through our work here in DC um, and broadly speaking. Um, and uh, I know the time got short, so it wasn't six minutes, so I'm gonna just be, be, quick, be quick. But uh, we also, we're also organizing a Saturday school program um, coming up in May uh, and it's gonna be going for six months long. So uh, Dr. Jessica, I might be reaching out to you if you wanna you know, uh, do a co, you know, work with uh, this program and also with us um, at some point um, with your work around co-ops. Um, uh, but, you know, we'll be inviting a lot of friends and folks from our own organization and community members to be speaking on a variety of topics. Um, you know, we're also socialist communists, so we're also struggling for that, that new world um, and, you know, trying to provide that political education to the community um, here in D.C. And, and, and elsewhere and try to influence folks and, you know, struggle against the, the capitalist media and uh, corporate dominated world, right, that we live in. And, uh, you know, we're struggling for peace for solidarity uh, with not, not only our brothers and sisters and comrades and, you know, struggling, uh, getting exploited at work, but also folks uh, suffering from US imperialism um, around the entire world. So, um, and we, we know we live within the empire here in the United States. So we gotta really struggle against uh, our enemies here um, who are right here in DC. So, uh, but anyways, I will be quiet because uh, I know Julian's like smiling at me, like shut, that, shut up. <laughs> Uh, but thank you so much again. Um, I appreciate y'all for the great talk and uh, hope to, you know, keep, keep being part of these conversations and continue the work. So appreciate it. Thanks, Dante. Thank you so much, Dante. Pre and appreciate the work that y'all are doing, um, for sure. Um, so next we have um, Angel, who is going to talk about the Malcolm X grassroots movement um, from the DC chapter. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation, Julian. Also, thank you to Dr. Nimbard for this wonderful presentation. I've learned a lot. I'm going to keep it short and sweet because I know we're pressed for time. 
Um, but as mentioned before, my name is Anne Hell. I am from the Malcolm X grassroots movement, and I'm an organizer with the DC chapter. And with the Malcolm X grassroots movement, we are we have about six chapters throughout the U.S. right now in Oakland, D.C., Philly, New York, Atlanta, Jackson, Mississippi, and Detroit, and also um, Champaign slash Chicago, Illinois. And we are fighting for the liberation of new African, Black, African people in the United States. And we have six principles that we follow, which are actively supporting and struggling to defend the human rights of African people in the U.S. and around the world. We actively oppose those social, economic, political, and cultural practices and structures that contribute to the violation of our hum people's human rights, whether it is based on ethnicity, nationality, social status, class, gender, or sexual orientation. We demand reparations or repayment for 400 years of slavery, colonialism, and oppression of our people in the United States. We promote self-determination and must organize for the liberation of the African nation held colonized in the United States. We oppose genocide or the acceptance of calculated killing of our people by individuals, institutions, and organizations of the U.S. government through lynching, lynching disease, police terror, and any other means. We demand the release of activists who have been in prison because of their commitment and seeking human rights and liberation for our people. These brothers and sisters are political prisoners and prisoners of war, and they should be recognized as such. We actively struggle to end sexist oppression. We oppose any form of oppression that limits women from reaching their fullest potential as manifested in our cultural, economic, political, and social institutions, practices, and beliefs. We actively oppose those beliefs beliefs, ideas, terms, etc., that limit the human worth of women and contribute to the violations against women and other marginalized genders. Uh, we also have information on our website about our solidarity economics and how we are trying to implement that, um, not just in the Jackson, Mississippi chapter, but also throughout all of our chapters. And I encourage folks to look into our Jackson Kush plan, which also talks about um, cooperative economics and solidarity economics as well. And thank you once again for having me. And it's been a wonderful presentation and I'll pass it back to Julian. Thank you, comrade. Always, always a pleasure. And so uh, to, to round us out, we'll have uh, Professor Anthony Cook, who is with the Coalition for Racial Equity, Racial Equity and Democratic Economy. Say, economies. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. The floor, the floor is yours. You got a couple minutes. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. Thank you for um, you know, organizing this. Thank you, Dr. Nimhart, for uh, your presentation and your, you know, um, your lifelong commitment to this struggle. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful. I'm a big fan of yours and um, using your book, as a matter of fact, uh, this summer in a course that I'm teaching on community development. So I uh, look forward to, to, to grappling with um, your concepts and, and principles and um, your research with students. Uh, we, we're in the planning year this year, um, formally launching in the fall. Uh, the Coalition for Racial Equity and Democratic Economy, CREED. And the, the, the focus of, of CREED is on community wealth building in disinvested communities. So the various flagship initiatives that we launch over the next few years will all be focused on, you know, how do we use cooperative ecosystem solidarity, um, uh, economics, uh, reparative uh, economics, to, to build wealth in black and brown disinvested communities. Uh, our first flagship initiative is gonna focus on uh, food sovereignty, food justice issues. Uh, and uh, uh, we're gonna try to, to create the platform for basically mobilizing a coalition of individuals and organizations around the uh, city to basically create a supply chain, integrated, integrated supply chain for the production of food, the processing and distribution of food, uh, and the retailing of food in our communities, right? Uh, one of the things that neoclassical, neoliberal economics has done in our communities is uh, it's been extraordinarily extractive. Uh, and 
basically retarding the wealth building capacity of our communities and building the wealth of other communities. And we want to reverse that process by being able to construct ecosystems based around cooperative economics and democratic economics to basically facilitate the production of our own food and the distribution and retail of our own food so that we can generate wealth in the community that stays in the community, hiring our people and training our people and putting our people in positions of not being renters, but owners, not being workers, but owner workers of the places where they work. Uh, so that's basically in a nutshell what we're attempting to do. We'll start off with the food sovereignty, then we'll staff that up and then transition to other areas to, to deal with community wealth building in those areas as well. So I look forward to getting to know you better and to give you a little bit more insight into what we're trying to do. Awesome. Um, thank you, Professor, Professor, Professor Cook. Um, so that puts us, yeah, right at, right at 7.30. Um, thank you all again for joining us this evening. Thank you, Professor Sissagor Nimhart for just being so gracious with your time and your knowledge and um, hopefully, and I'm sure that's the case that, you know, folks learned a lot and can take a lot of, of what we learned today with them into next steps. And so the next session again will be uh, slated for June 20th at the same time. And so we will provide public, uh, publicity with respect to that um, in, the coming, in the coming months. But uh, until we meet again, you all take care and thank you again.